May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. My name is Sarah. Actually, it was originally Sarah, but God changed my name later in one of his promises to my husband, Abram. Actually, the Lord changed his name too, but I'm getting ahead of myself. After we were married, we and his brothers and their wives moved around a lot, really a lot. God was all speaking to Abram and asking him to go somewhere else and telling him that he would bless him and make a great nation out of him. Every time I heard that, I wondered if the Lord was mistaken, because so far, we had no children. I kept hoping that the promise was good and that I was indeed part of that promise, but I was already deeply saddened and really felt rather ashamed. I thought there was something wrong with me, that I couldn't give my husband a child. In fact, in some of the places we moved to, Abram worried that the king would see me as beautiful as he saw me and kill him to get to me. So he asked me to pose as his sister instead of his wife. But then when the king did take me to his palace, God caused disasters on the king's people. And when the king found out that I was not really Abram's wife, or excuse me, sister, but in fact his wife, sometimes they threw us out of that land. And after some time, <clears throat> the Lord made a covenant with Abram that he indeed would receive the land we were in. Meanwhile, I knew I was getting too old to bear children. I was skeptical. But then I remembered that there had been a custom among some of our women to give their servant to sleep with their husband. And that way they passed on their inheritance to the child born by the servant. I decided to give my servant Hagar to Abram, hoping I could obtain children by her. So my husband took Hagar as his wife and went into, into her tent, and she conceived. Oh, I had mixed emotions. On the one hand, we would finally have a child, but on the other hand, I was still not a mother. And on top of that, Hagar, my own servant, began to be really mean to me. She just felt so superior that she let that hurt. I was already an outsider to most of the other women. Now even my own servant despised me. I yelled at my husband, Abram, that it was his fault. He told me I could do whatever I wanted with her. So I was pretty mean to her. And she ran away. Well, at the time, I thought, Good riddance. At least I'm no worse off than I was before. I guess she went out into the wilderness, but I hear a message from God appeared to her out there and told her to come back to me. But he also told her that she was going to have a boy and that she would have many offspring. Well, she did have a boy. And they named him Ishmael, God hears, because Hagar believed that God heard her sorrow. What about me and my sorrow of not having a child? God listens to his slave girl, but not to me who first married Abram? Well, I kept on going. God only knows how. And after all, I was still a household to run. <clears throat> a few years later, God appears again to Abram, now 99 years old. And again tells him he really is going to be the father of many nations. And changes his name from Abram to Abraham. The ham on the end means many. And furthermore, God apparently tells him to start calling me Sarah, which means princess, instead of Sarah, and that he would bless me and give me a son. Well, as you might imagine, my husband fell on his face and laughed inside, wondering how anybody 100 years old was going to father a son. Then one day, not long after that, some men showed up at Abraham's tent. Well, we all scrambled to make them feel at home, and I worked on getting something together to eat. But I kept ear to the outside of the tent to find out who these guys were and what they were up to. 
Well, what do you know? I heard them say that within a year, I, Sarah, would have a son. I nearly burst trying to hold in my laughter. Yeah, right. This ancient body, not to mention Abraham's. How could that possibly happen? And after all these years of yearning and lament, is it possible that I could really be happy? But somehow they must have heard me. Or somehow they read my thoughts because they asked, is anything too wonderful for the Lord? So later that year, a son was born to me from my own womb. We call him Isaac, which means laughter, because we both laughed over the news that we would have a child together at our ages. Life seemed to go well, and I was happy. But then a few years later, on the feast day, when Isaac was being weaned, I saw Hagar's son Ishmael playing with my son Isaac, and I suddenly remembered how mean his mom had been to me when she first was pregnant with him. And I realized that her son could inherit what really belongs to my son. Oh, no. I couldn't have that. I begged Abraham to send him away. Abraham was reluctant because Ishmael was his son, too. But I was so insistent that he sent them off. So we have Sarah and Abraham, less than perfect people, who are nevertheless blessed by God. Sarah was a bold risk taker. Sometimes these characters follow what God asks. Sometimes they take things into their own hands to help out God, or out of fear for their own lives, or they weren't listening to God at the time, or maybe they couldn't accept what God wanted them to do. Yet God blessed them. And they are the father and mother of many nations. We have Hagar, who was blessed with a child, but for a time was mean to Sarah. But Hagar enjoyed a personal relationship with God and received revelations from him. And he intervened for her in the wilderness twice. The first, when Sarah was so mean to her that Hagar had made a bold move to run away to the wilderness, and the second, after Sarah made Abraham drive her away. Here's the rest of Hagar's story. God told Abraham not to fret about sending her away because it's through Isaac, his offspring with Sarah, through whom the, his descendants would be counted. But that since Ishmael was his son too, God would make a great nation from him as well. So after Abraham drove her into the wilderness, Hagar once again met a messenger from God who came in the nick of time when the food and water that Abraham had given them had run out. She had put the child under the shade of a tree to keep him out of the sun. And when it was off, because she didn't want to watch him die. What agony she must have gone through. Her joy at having a son came to this? Just to be driven out to die? The message then opened Hagar's eyes, and she saw a well nearby from which she was able to get water for her son. The messenger told her that her son, too, would father many nations. So despite her original boasting to Sarai over having birthed a son, God blessed her and Ishmael, too, and made Ishmael also an ancestor of a great nation. Hagar is yet another imperfect person. <clears throat> at one moment, boldly treating Sarah with a chip on her shoulder. At another moment, a great mom and open to God's revelation in her life. God blessed her and her son, too. Sometimes their bold actions may not have been the best action to do at the time, but God was able to use it anyway. Let's take a quick look at a couple of other bold women. Hannah. Elkanah had two wives, Hannah and Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah had not been able to conceive. Hannah was greatly provoked and teased by the second wife. Hannah was very distraught and could not be consoled by her husband, Elkanah. Unlike Sarah and Hagar, 
Hannah boldly took her sorrow to the Lord. She fervently prayed for a son and vowed to dedicate him to the priesthood. You may remember the story of her praying in the house of worship and the priest who observed her thought she was drunk because she was, her lips were moving but no sounds coming out. When he chided her, she explained that she was pouring out her soul in anxiety on, out to the Lord. The priest blessed her and asked the Lord to grant her request. She went home in peace and soon conceived and had a son she named Samuel, who is for God, whom, when he was weaned, she took back to the house of the Lord to lend him for as long as he lives. What a bold move to give up a young, longed-for child. Each year she made a little robe for him and took it to the house of worship, and the priest blessed her and prayed that the Lord would repay her gift, her gift with more children. And indeed, she did have more children. Who knows why Hannah had to wait so long and endure so much before she was able to conceive. But God indeed heard her fervent prayer and was with her. But not all women's woes are about bearing children. Now from the New Testament, let's consider Dorcas. Dorcas in the Greek, or Tabitha in Hebrew, there's only seven verses about her in the book Acts, chapter 9. But one of the key facts is that only here in the book of Acts is a woman explicitly called a disciple. A disciple is one who learns, but also one who follows. Dorcas had adopted the views and teachings of Jesus and lovingly ministered to the poor around her, carefully sewing robes and other items to clothe them. Dorcas took ill and died, and her body was being washed for burial. Many women surrounded her, weeping and admiring her handiwork and proclaiming how much she had helped so many people. Her friends urgently sent two men to Peter, who came, and perhaps remembering the similar act that Jesus performed when he prayed over a little girl, Jairus' daughter, and took her by the hand and said, Talitha, Talitha kum, little girl, get up. Peter prayed and took the woman by the hand and said, Tabitha, get up. And she opened her eyes and got up. She became a witness for many others in the region of Joppa who came to believe in the Lord. In her boldness of becoming a woman disciple of Jesus and being a witness for others and her new lease on life, she's an inspiration to us as well. She has been an inspiration for the Dorcas societies all over the world, helping the poor. <clears throat> From our gospel lesson, we are called to take up the cross and follow Christ. Sometimes that means we are to take a bold action for our human, fellow humans or some other part of creation. There is much suffering, anxiety, and angst in this world. Taking up the cross means to carry a burden for someone who is suffering. Suffering is a human condition on this side of heaven. We can't and shouldn't trivialize someone's suffering. But we can be assured that God is in there, and we can assure the one who is suffering as well. Because we have a God who knows suffering. Through Jesus, we know that God knows suffering because Jesus endured the cross. God hears our cries, just as he heard Sarah's, Hagar's, Ishmael's, Hannah's, Dorcas's, and so many others. And he walks with us in the suffering. Because we are God's children, we are called to be bold in Christ. Because we are God's children, we are called to take up the cross of another. And because we are God's children, God blesses us. Let us have the courage to be bold and take up that cross. Amen.